Good afternoon. It is my distinct pleasure to speak to you today about Wayne Thiebaud's latest series of paintings, which he called Clowns, Just Clowns. The series was uh, completed uh, in the late 2020. He started it in 2015. And this is the first museum presentation of uh, this body of work. The Clown series is the latest uh, series that Thibault finished in 2020. It was started in 2015. The series is based on uh, what he called his clown memories, the recollections of the visiting, uh, the traveling circus, the Ringling Brothers that he uh, saw as uh, a young uh, teen in Long Beach, California, where he lived with his family at the time. But it is much more than um, just um, a revival of recollections and memories. It is a look at life uh, from the vantage point of over seven decades of painting, uh, many decades of teaching, uh, looking at art, talking about art, lecturing about art. It really has this prism of life through which uh, the memories are seen. And um, uh, it is also extremely sensitive of uh, contemporaneous context, the cultural context, as well as the context of art history in which the painters and the sculptors and uh, later cinematographers engaged the uh, theme and the subject matter of clowns. Thibault painted clowns before in this work from 1972, it's a portrait of a clown. Uh, you could see some traits that reappear in uh, some of the works in the show. For example, uh, this work, Clown with Eyelashes from 2014. But uh, previously, he never tackled the subject systematically. And uh, once uh, the series was started, he uh, addressed not only the uh, current considerations that he had, but he also looked back at the previous history of um, uh, clown paintings and clown drawings. Clowns, uh, and here you're looking at a work by Jean-Antoine Watteau, a French uh, painter from the 18th century, is a Rococo painter. Uh, clowns and their cousins, um, they're different iterations of clowns. They're Piros, Harlequins, Bajazos, Pulcinellis, Mountain Banks, Badens, Jesters, Tramp Clowns in the 20th century, and Zannies. Uh, clowns occupied artists' imagination for many centuries. And uh, they played a uh, different role. They were represented with, for, for a different purpose. It wasn't just uh, uh, always kind of a... a an image of a clown entertaining the public. Uh, sometimes clowns stood in uh, for humans uh, at large. Uh, sometimes they represented bohemian aloofness. Uh, uh, at other times they were presented as um, multivalent or maybe mysterious. And uh, perhaps uh, sometimes they were timeless, uh, isolated figures, um, alienated figures. They're clowns that are supernatural and demonic. They're clowns that are miraculous, miraculous, uh, ordinary clowns, marvelous clowns. There's a whole, uh, there's a whole typology of clowns that has been painted over many centuries. And Thibault is well aware of this tradition. So, for example, uh, in uh, this uh, uh, work by Tiepolo from the uh, from 1735, you see uh, a group of uh, Puccinellos uh, uh, enjoying a feast. And in this work by Honoré de Mier, uh, you have two characters from a play by Moliere, uh, which um, uh, are not acting out their clown deeds, but they rather they represent types. So uh, over the centuries, painters invested clowns with uh, different, uh, different meaning. And one of them was uh, treating a clown as a surrogate for uh, an artist, 
trying to establish the position of an artist vis-a-vis -vis the, the crowd. So if the crowd um, is uh, um, uh, admires the artist or the, the crowd boos the artist, uh, the clown off stage, uh, this was part of the presentation. And uh, often the clowns were, again, they were stand -in, just stand-ins for human beings. So they would show the extremes of human behavior uh, where uh, a, a person cannot do certain things, a clown could. And so the clowns were shown as uh, examples of fallible humans, awkward humans, uh, uh, ridiculous humans. And uh, there's a grain of um, very sort of pessimistic view of uh, human beings and uh, human deficiency, something that we could not play out in normal lives, clowns can do. They can be awkward, they can be laughed at. So it, it always traditionally, I shouldn't say always, it often served as an outlet for our own, own awkwardness and uh, inability to um, uh, do things well. Here's a work by uh, Gustave Courbet, another French artist. So this is from the uh, middle of the 19th century. This is a reproduction of a drawing with the clown uh, frightened, the Pierrot type frightened by the black arm growing out of the ground. In this uh, image, uh, there is a, another Pierrot who is grimacing. This one is by the famous illustrator Gustave Doré. And uh, here is a Pierre Bonnard. Uh, Bonnard was, uh, uh, Bonnard is uh, one of the uh, favorite painters of Cibo, and I'll come back to his work later on in the presentation, uh, but here is his read on uh, the circus. And this one is from the late 19th century. Uh, another example is uh, a Pablo Picasso painting of an acrobat and a young harlequin. Picasso, as you of course know, has been uh, painting clowns uh, and, and circus folk quite a bit. And of course, there's George Roll, who is perhaps uh, the most famous French uh, painter of clowns. And clowns in his work have a religious dimension. Uh, there's almost um, a crossover between the Christ figure and the clown in his work. And uh, that um, cross theme becomes really significant in what uh, Thibault is going to be interpreting when he um, uh, when, when he uh, addresses the uh, nature of the clown. Here is uh, a painting, a late painting by André Duran. Duran is a Fauve painter, of course, and um, uh, Fauvism has a, a huge influence on Thibault's work and the paintings in the show, almost Every painting in the show is an example of beautiful fall application of paint with contrasting colors. So, uh, but this one is a Lee Duran, uh, a Harlequin and Pierrot uh, with musical instruments. This is from 1940, 24. And uh, finally, of course, there are American painters who also took up the, the topic, the subject matter of clowns. Uh, here's a beautiful Edward Hopper painting, The Blue Evening, which he actually used the French title for that, uh, perhaps hinting at this whole circus culture and the uh, European associations. Um, this one is from 1914. And uh, last but not le least, uh, there's a uh, uh, work of Walt Kuhn, uh, an American painter who is uh, also a big uh, clown painter. Uh, he has uh, multiple works which represent clowns and this kind of crossover between the clown and the painter and the artist. Uh, I should also add here that Thibault collects uh, Walt Kuhn. So uh, I first learned about the series in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2017. I. Uh, saw a few paintings in the studio. Of, um, uh, I saw a few paintings in Wayne Thibault's studio among the other works. Uh, there were clown paintings. And uh, at the time I was of course intrigued, but I 
couldn't make much of it. And um, when the topic came up, uh, Tivo said, he just said, well, I'm painting clowns now uh, with a twinkle in his eye. Um, and that was that. And on my subsequent visits, the, the body of work began to grow, uh, began to grow actually uh, in geometric proportions. There were more and more of those paintings and drawings. And uh, we began talking about the series. And um, uh, as the uh, work progressed, uh, so this, uh, you're looking at the shot of the studio here with the paintings lined up along the walls. Uh, this is from 2019. And uh, here's another view. So this is the other wall. So you could recognize some of the paintings in the show, except if you uh, uh, look carefully, if you could compare the paintings in the show with the paintings leaned against the wall, uh, they do look different because uh, part of the progress uh, of, of work for Wayne Thibault is to repaint, to alter, and to change his paintings. And that has to do with a really important feature of uh, Thibault uh, as a painter, his open-endedness. He really has no uh, preconceived expectation. He is a process painter in the sense that he is interested in painting first and foremost, and then uh, uh, the result might or might not work out. And so just to illustrate this point, uh, let me show you uh, in this slide. Um, well, actually, um, this slide is uh, the patient zero of the series. This is the first, the small painting, Clown and Circle. And I'll come back to it. Uh, but uh, here is a, a slide that shows a progression of how one painting can change. So uh, reading from left to right, these are various interpretations of the painting that ends up in the show. The one on the right is the one in the show. The one on the left, this is how it started. I took uh, the first four pictures uh, throughout 2019. You could see when uh, the painting um, first came into existence, it had this really pale rose background and then it began to change. Uh, the first image, the one on the left, you could see it doesn't have a frame. So this was before the, the canvas went into the frame and the subsequent ones were already framed. And if you look at the next slide, uh, the clown in silver wig is uh, actually, uh, this is the, the painting which is in the show. And this painting is one of the few that is based on a real person, a real clown, not uh, just a concoction uh, from memory uh, and imagination, but this is based on Amelia Butler, who was the first uh, recognized female clown, as far as we know, and uh, there are photographs of her in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, making clown paintings in general uh, represented a triple challenge uh, for Thibault. Uh, first of all, so there's this aspect of uh, trying to reinterpret the memories of the past. Then uh, many of the paintings, uh, most of the paintings actually I should say, uh, contain human figures because clowns are of course humans. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, there is a big emphasis in the paintings on making the clowns, um, to, on translating this nature of clowns as both humans and, and, um, uh, and, and um, um, apparitions. Uh, so there is this quality to most of the work in the show that um, uh, represents the figures, not just as human figures, but as also uh, carriers of emotion or, or some other meaning. And then uh, the third part of the challenge, in addition to uh, conveying the memories and representing human figure, the third part is um, this idea of investing the uh, paintings with philosophical meaning. And on the part of Thibault, who is extremely humble and uh, he's uh, the least uh, uh, prone uh, person to, to prone to um, wagging his finger and telling people what to do, but um, inevitably, because of the depth of his life experience and uh, because the meaning of his work is essentially philosophical, um, the paintings that Sirius reflects the philosophical depth, and uh, uh, I will uh, 
make um, uh, more of that argument when we look back at his early um, paintings, at his early uh, still lives of cakes and confections. So uh, in this slide, you could see a, a 1930s poster of the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, which by then was a combined circus. And that's the circus that traveled uh, all over the country. Um, I actually looked at their schedule and it looks like every summer in July or August, they ended up, or September, they ended up uh, in this location in Long Beach. And so this is during the depression era and um, uh, Thibault and his pals would go to the, uh, uh, to the fairgrounds and they would uh, offer uh, to work for the people at the circus. They would clean the cages and uh, help elevate the tents. And in return, they get tickets for the sideshows and the, the circus um, uh, acts. And uh, when uh, we began to discuss the, the series, when I started asking questions about the clown series, uh, Tipo indicated that uh, his memories of the circus were really quite complex. The thing that he emphasized to me was that the circus, he saw it as a magic world. And uh, it was, there's, uh, he, he used the phrase bright pathos. So it was exciting, but at the same time, there's this unmistakably ambivalent um, sentiment that he had because he, uh, uh, pointed out that, that, that there was a lot of contrast and extremes and that the clowns were not necessarily uh, happy people. They were sometimes, uh, I quote, ominous and very nasty fellows. Uh, so there's that. And, and so his reaction and his memory, the imprint in how he perceived that circus was this combination um, of um, happy and scary, the combination, the vacillation between joy and fear. And uh, that is a really important thing to remember because again, uh, the series is not a representation of some you know, idealized romanticized past visits to the circus. It is uh, more of a, a sensation, translated sensation of something which is very uh, conflicted and has uh, two parts to it always. So uh, one of the uh, important influences on the series, which uh, you could see in this slide, is uh, uh, the cartoons of George Harriman. George Harriman, for those of you who have uh, read uh, and listened to Thibault's interviews, uh, is a very important influence on him. Uh, Harriman, of course, was a famous cartoonist, uh, but he was also considered even at the time in 1920s, he was argued to be a fine artist and um, critics picked up on it because of the way he approached representation. It was not narrative, it was actually uh, quite inventive. So um, the way I would say uh, Thibault uses Harriman in the series, aside from this more general influence, there's this um, element in, in uh, Harriman's Crazy Cat and as well as in many other cartoons and in, in fact, in Disney cartoons and um, Thibault famously uh, worked for uh, the Disney uh, when uh, he began his artistic career. Um, the, the quality that translates from cartoons into paintings is uh, the, this, this sort of magical uh, denial of physical facts. The, uh, suspension of disbelief. In the cartoons, the characters often get uh, run over, blown up, um, and uh, uh, all sorts of misfortunes come onto them, uh, but then they emerge uh, unscathed. And uh, this is something that really uh, travels, uh, really um, uh, uh, that um, uh, Thibault adapts in his paintings of clowns. For example, in this work, the bumping clowns from 2016, you see two clowns that are heading for a collision uh, and it should be a bloody collision because their noses are gonna be involved. But as we look at this painting, we don't have a sense of, even though there is an imminent, imminent collision in the works, uh, we don't have a sense of um, uh, the pain that they're about to experience because 
somehow Thibault manages to uh, make to make light of the physical facts. You have this uh, suspension of disbelief applied to uh, the uh, physical notion of that the collision of two big male bodies would produce um, uh, pain. And his point of reference, interestingly enough, um, is to the real life uh, tennis players, uh, the Bryan brothers. Uh, now, uh, Thibaut himself is an avid tennis player. And um, uh, so he uses tennis as a reference here and it makes the whole thing into something comical as opposed to uh, something that uh, can be read straight up as, uh, as uh, a pending, an impending disaster. So uh, with this burden of verisimilitude removed, you could move into a space of um, imagination of magic and a space where if in doubt you kind of go uh, with the lighter interpretation with the more uh, merciful interpretation. This is quite important for the whole attitude that Thibaut has to his clowns. Um, among other sources and so now I'm talking and moving past the paintings and the cartoons uh, you could see in this slide is, this is a still from Marcel Carney's famous uh, movie, The Children of Paradise. Uh, this was one of the sources that Thibaut pointed me to when uh, we were discussing the clown series as uh, something that was influential for him. And so um, uh, my take uh, on why uh, this particular this particular work of art was important for the clown series has to do with the main character of uh, the movie. His name is Baptiste de Bureau, and uh, he's a clown, he's a sad clown. He's uh, uh, quite, uh, quite loved by the crowd. And so uh, the movie presents one of the, it's, it's a complex um, work of art, but one of the themes in the movie is uh, what success does to a person, what success does to an, artic, an artist? How does the adulation of the crowd changes the course of um, an artist's life? So uh, this is uh, uh, an important point that actually has, uh, has quite a bit of philosophical weight in the series. And um, here's another source for the uh, clown series. And this is probably uh, well, uh, this is probably arguably the most important source and uh, uh, Thibaut drew my attention to it continuously as we were speaking about the series. Uh, the uh, source is, the, is a short novella by Henry Miller. Uh, it's called the, the, the Smile at the Foot of the Letter. It was written in 1948. Originally it was written as a text for um, a set of artworks, clown artwork, circus themed artwork by Ferdinand Leger. But uh, Leger rejected the text. He didn't like it. And uh, Miller ended up uh, publishing his own version uh, with his own illustrations, interestingly enough. And um, that short book is uh, hugely important for the series. The book has uh, a, an afterword where Miller explains the uh, kind of the, the uh, philosophical underpinnings of his story because the story is a parable of uh, a clown uh, who is a Christ-like figure. Uh, so in the afterword, Miller says, I quote, a clown is a poet in action. He is the story which he enacts. It is the same story over and over, adoration, devotion, crucifixion, end quote. So uh, you have in the story, you have this paradigm of a clown as a stand-in for uh, a human figure. And uh, one of the questions again, that already uh, I mentioned uh, with um, Carnet's uh, film, the Children of Paradise. Again, the question uh, rises, what about the idealization of the artist? What about, what is the effect that the 
adulation uh, has on uh, a work of the artist. And so in the novella, Miller unpacks uh, how uh, Auguste uh, has after uh, after an incident, he realizes that he needs to kind of go back to his human roots and uh, uh, he needs to uh, realize that th the circus, essentially, the space of creating art is a closed off arena of forgetfulness where it is easy to forget that you're a human being and uh, you can lose yourself, you can dissolve in the bliss of um, your artistry uh, as it is reflected uh, by the adoring crowd. And uh, uh, Miller argues that this is a trap, that this is a false path. And uh, so uh, if uh, in this case, a clown uh, remains in the circus and he just performs his act and he goes through the motions, uh, which uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the motions of the clown simulate the motions, the stages in the life of a human being. Um, and uh, that is uh, limiting, uh, that is limiting for the clown as an artist, as a human being, and it leads to the disconnect between, uh, between uh, uh, the artist and a person. And so um, what uh, Miller proposes is that the, the clown needs to avoid the trap of fame and be satisfied by just uh, making people smile. No applause, no loud adulation, just a little smiles. Another important topic that um, Miller brings up in the book, which is, uh, uh, again, travels into the series of clown paintings, Tibus clown paintings, is the theme of the tragic comic. Uh, in the uh, book cover on the screen, you could see this is uh, one of the illustrations in the book, which Miller uh, drew. And in this drawing of the clown, you could see that he has two mouths. And he said, one for joy and the other one for sorrow. And this is the representation of the tragic comic. There's a, a element of laughter and then there's an element of tragedy. And the tragic comic as it stands, it's not just a combination of laughter and grief, but it is the tension, the continuous tension, which uh, is uh, clearly uh, the case uh, for this painting the clown boots from 2018, 2019, uh, which uh, uh, Thibaut paints. You have uh, each boot with the alternate expression. The concept of the tragic comic really embraces the complexity of life, uh, the complexity of the need to reconcile different types of um, uh, different types of emotions, different types of events. And um, uh, so in these boots, which are anthropomorphic, uh, in the same way uh, Van Gogh's famous boots are anthropomorphic uh, and uh, are a stand-in for the real characters, character to whom uh, they belong. Um, in this case, the tragic comedy is represented as the union of two opposites. And uh, you have to acknowledge that this is the way life is. And so the clowns are not always happy clowns, uh, the you know, uh, party clowns entertaining, but the clowns also represent the inevitable human tragedy, um, the uh, uh, process of life that has to do with our existence, which is much more than laughter and entertainment. There were other sources uh, for the series. Uh, in this slide, uh, you could see a, a, a wonderful uh, landmark, Sacramento landmark, the Pancake Circus Diner. Uh, the diner is um, uh, circus themed and I um, uh, visited it with um, uh, Thibaut who introduced me to the manager of, of um, uh, the, the restaurant. Her name is uh, Terry Mead. Uh, she's, uh, you could say that she's a de facto curator of the space because um, the restaurant has uh, many more artworks than fit into the current space. And so they rotated in and out of storage. The uh, whole um, uh, 
uh, collection is crowdsourced. Uh, people bring clown-related art to the restaurant and their paintings, their figurines, uh, uh, all sorts of toys. Uh, and um, it is uh, the circus world. And uh, Wayne Thibault himself, actually, he donated uh, one of the objects in the, um, uh, in the um, case uh, in the restaurant is a book uh, that he donated. It's uh, a collection uh, published uh, by Diane Keaton. Actually, I have a copy of my own here. So there you go. And uh, this is a compilation of um, paintings and objects uh, about clowns by uh, people uh, that range from Woody Allen to Sandra Bernard to Larry David to Robin Williams. Um, so this is a contemporary, contemporaneous source for the series. Um, uh, but besides that personal context and the context of um, art history that represents clowns, um, there is also a larger, a broader cultural context. And in this slide, um, uh, this is really kind of uh, quite stra stra straightforward, you could see that these are the icons for social media, various social media platforms. Uh, the point I'd like to make here as I show these is that um, uh, in my mind, uh, Tibo's series is uh, also a somber commentary on the human condition. And um, uh, it's a commentary on the human condition in the way that it has been changing and it changed uh, the idea of that our reality is now uh, infused by um, mediated experiences. Uh, in 1967, a French theorist, French uh, uh, Marxist philosopher, Guy Debord, wrote um, a, a book uh, which is called The Society of the Spectacle. Um, Society of the Spectacle argues that, and this is as of 1967, so we made some uh, uh, progress in the wrong direction since then. Uh, but the book argues that uh, people moved from uh, the state of being to the state of having to the state of appearing. In other words, uh, if you start with genuine human experiences, face-to-face -face human experiences, then the next stage would be humans uh, uh, identify themselves by what they have, what they own, and that would be the conspicuous consumption of the probably 80s. And then, um, but nowadays you have the situation where it is all about appearing. Um, uh, best example would probably would be Instagram postings when, when people uh, post their food that is getting cold and that is more real than the real food that is on the table in front of them. Um, so uh, that is kind of a fact of life and it shifts the whole uh, human dimension into the dimension of uh, reflected reality. And so, as uh, I mentioned in the beginning, part of the clown persona is the way the clown is supposed to stand in for a human being. So this is again, this is the, the, this kind of mediation. And uh, um, uh, in this uh, image, so this is kind of just to, to drive this point a little bit further, um, you have, uh, this is just a random cartoon I found, but um, uh, you have a couple here, they're in bed in the computer and each one of them has their own entertainment. Uh, but the point here is that you move um, from the 19th century where you have this big crowd and you have a three ring circus and literally the crowd is there. It's a multitude of people and there's a multitude of acts and uh, they, can all, they can all be seen at once. And now we're at a point where the primary mode of entertainment is a single person with a single tablet or a single phone. And uh, that of course, again, that moves us into this mediated space, this space away from real life. And so then clowns become a fairly good model for uh, the way we behave. In this image, and this is one of those cutouts that uh, 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 Tibo shared with me as um, I, I was doing my research on the clown series. Uh, it looks like, to me, it looks like um, an image from a magazine and it shows two uh, young uh, women who are dressed in the clothes that are really um, from the uh, clown 
uh, garb family. Um, this is another dimension of how clowns and circus and clowning go into our lives. So even if you look at street fashion nowadays, you have uh, things like, uh, you know, cute hair, oversized boots, uh, pants that are um, uh, too large. And uh, uh, this is just kind of in, in one dimension. Another dimension, you have people going on uh, TV shows and doing all sorts of video um, videos, posting things on TikTok. Uh, a lot of exposure. So you have, uh, instead of the professional clowns that were supposed to entertain the public, the public now uh, becomes clownish. And uh, so uh, it's, it's, um, it's almost like um, an, in television, instead of the professional script writers, you have reality TV, um, then the clowns move onto the streets. And uh, uh, so here's just another image uh, to uh, prove that same point. Uh, a headline from uh, InStyle magazine, which comments on uh, how fashions became clown fashions. The headline reads, how did we all end up dressing like clowns this summer? And uh, then the presentation follows with all sorts of designers uh, making uh, clothes that, that look like uh, clown clothes. So um, that uh, is in the air and um, of course uh, if we take a little sidestep from it we will end up in uh, the world of politics. Uh, this cartoon which shows uh, two clowns walking uh, down the street uh, just uh, uh, t tells everything here everything you need to know is in the description. I quote the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil clowns is that good clowns do nothing, end quote. Uh, Thibaut shared this cartoon with me again. I um, uh, don't want to uh, over uh, exaggerate um, the uh, potential sort of the, the implications of um, the connections between clowns and politics, but uh, I would like to show you a few things that were out there in the ether while uh, Thibault was painting his series. And so you decide for yourself how much of it is related to politics. Uh, this is a cover of Daily News and uh, it's from February of 2016. So this is right before the, uh, the, the 2016 election. It shows the future president as uh, a sad clown and the inscription reads, dead clown walking. Uh, and then there are two little inserts, again, mentioning clowns, clown runs for president and insane clown posse. Uh, again, drawing direct uh, comparisons between clowning and politics and uh, um, uh, equally uh, mocking um, uh, insert on the bottom about the opposing side. How does it uh, uh, relate to the clown show? Well, in this slide from, uh, I took this uh, uh, photograph in 2019, but this is a painting which is now in the show and uh, I'll, I'll show you that one uh, in a second. But so in this one, you could see there's a clown at the podium and he's speaking and behind him, there's a big poster with another clown with his arm raised in the air and um, uh, the inscription vote, exclamation mark. So this is right. Uh, uh, so this is uh, um, probably, um, I, don't, I don't know the exact date on it, but again, the painting in the show is dated by 2017. And here it is, the clown speaker. And uh, as you could see, the poster has been erased now there's a blank white space and the clown seems to be uh, screaming up in the air and um, something resembling confetti is coming out of his mouth. So uh, that's how it stands right now. So uh, uh, my point here is, is that this was part of the uh, zeitgeist uh, all along. For, so from uh, those five years that Thibaut has been working on the series, the clowns were part of the conversation. And so if you look at this slide, 
of the cover of Art Forum magazine from uh, 2018, you could see that the same question of clowns is taken up now in the blue chip art world publication. Uh, and here it is done uh, in a way of asking the question uh, of, uh, uh, so what is, what is going on with the, um, uh, all of a sudden there's a serious uptick in clown art. They're, they're artists, contemporary artists uh, who show uh, art, clown related artworks in galleries. And the theme of the volume, interestingly enough, was not, uh, it was not clowns, it was monsters. And the argument that the, the, the editor uh, who wrote um, uh, and the essay that goes with the image in the cover uh, was that uh, the, the character on the cover, his name is Gritty, he's a mascot of the Philadelphia Flyers, he's actually the anti-clown. And the anti-clown is supposed to be an antidote to the evil clowns of the current political establishment. This is what uh, uh, she's arguing. Uh, we are living in the era of evil clowns. This is uh, uh, the um, quotation in the slide you're looking at. We're living in the era of evil clowns and ludicrous monsters because they are what crawl out of the cracks when the bedrock breaks, end quote. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a take of, um, uh, on a culture in which uh, at that point, this is 2019, in which state, in, in which comical moments at state funerals are normalized and in which we're getting used to the grotesque and the abnormal. And uh, so the argument that uh, uh, Shambhalan makes in her article is that in previous instances in history, in art history, when artists encountered periods of evil clowning, um, they produced the art that was actually, even though it seemed satirical and it seemed um, uh, uh, like a kind of a reverse response almost, it was actually realistic reportage because the things were so distorted and so evil that making art that showed evil distorted things uh, was actually just holding up the mirror to that. So that was the, the argument again in art form. And uh, if you look at this image, this is a, a compilation of um, various newspaper articles uh, in reaction to Boris Johnson's uh, elevation uh, to the position of prime minister. Uh, again, uh, this theme of clowns as politicians, politicians as clowns is uh, driven um, uh, through, uh, driven in by the press, uh, which uh, mentions uh, the clownish quality of Boris Johnson more than once. So uh, all of this culminates in, I would say, in, 19, in, in 2019 uh, film, uh, The Joker by Todd Phillips. And you could see in this slide, you could see the protagonist, he's uh, uh, doing his famous dance on that famous staircase. Of course, this is an evil clown. He's a sociopath and um, he's just perfect for our times in 2019. Um, all right. so. Uh, but as we look at all of this, so this is this is there, this is real, this is, uh, as I said, the zeitgeist. But of course, Thibaut has very little interest in uh, doing this sort of uh, countercultural performative um, art making that that uh, art forum calls for. The, um, what he's doing is completely different. Uh, he is not interested in in uh, uh, straight up political commentary clearly. Uh, in fact, in the series, he tries to avoid what he calls contextual impropriety, by which he meant when, say, the clowns are engaged in the acts that are not naturally, that are, where they're cast in the acts which are not normal things that clowns do. Um, uh, so uh, in the course of the development of the series, the few paintings that had those contextual improprieties were uh, repainted or removed, and the boat painting is one example of it. So my understanding is that it was too uh, too contextual. It was too narrative. It had too much of a 
uh, an opinion, too much of a message. Um, so instead of engaging in this, uh, in this uh, uh, kind of, uh, it could be realistic reportage on a really scary age, or it could be uh, some sort of satirical, um, uh, satirical treatment. Instead of that, what paintings in the clown series do, I think uh, they provide a really badly needed humanistic pause uh, because they raise the questions that are beyond politics, beyond all of those uh, facile comparisons of politicians and clowns and even, uh, um, you know, um, uh, all of the, all of the um, proper acknowledgements of difficult situations uh, we might be in. Uh, in the end, what Tibo is doing is uh, painting. Now, uh, what I would like to do uh, now is to uh, speak to you about how um, clowns as a body of work relates to Thibaut's Uber at large. And in order to do this, I uh, would like to talk to you about uh, an article that came out, uh, you could see it in the slide, um, an article that came out in the San Francisco Chronicle in July of 19. 62. Um, and uh, the article was printed in conjunction with um, Thibaut's solo show at the De Young Museum. That was uh, the show that uh, brought him critical acclaim. Uh, and uh, it mostly featured uh, paintings, uh, the, the still lives of confections and cakes. And uh, so the, the um, uh, kind of uh, the clever um, title of this article is, is a lollipop tree worth painting. Uh, interestingly enough, it was supposed to be, originally it was supposed to be a review, but when the reviewer um, gave um, Tibu a set of questions that he was supposed to uh, answer to help to, to um, com compose the text, the answers were so good uh, that um, the, the editor ended up just publishing the whole um, response, Tibo's response in full, and there was no review. Uh, to Thibault's consternation. Uh, but uh, that essay is really, really important for understanding both what he was thinking in 1962 and how we can project the current work onto uh, his uh, uh, larger output over many, many decades. So um, the essay was organized in a way that um, split things by, by uh, theme. So there was a section on light, a section on space, a section on color. And then there was a section called the philosophic viewpoint. And um, all of those uh, sections, they very much coincide with the categories uh, that um, were the topics of uh, my discussions with uh, Thibault about the clown series over the last uh, uh, three years or so. Um, he thinks in terms of um, the way painting is done. Uh, he is uh, very interested, uh, and you could see that from his interviews and from his lectures, in uh, the uh, nitty gritty of how um, paintings um, are made uh, in, in the so-called formal questions. Although I should say right away here that uh, at some point, uh, he uh, claimed that he was a formalist and he was corrected by his critic and his friend and his colleague, uh, philosopher Richard Wolheim, who pointed out to Thibault that um, perhaps he wasn't that much of a formalist because he actually, he cared about the subject matter too much. And uh, Thibault agreed with that. Uh, so in this case, so the, the, the portion about the philosophic new viewpoint is really quite important. And I'll get to the formal things in a second, but the philosophic new viewpoint here really states very clearly his existentialist stance. Uh, and uh, I'm referring here to the, uh, to the branch in French uh, post-war philosophy, the way um, it was adapted by Thibault, which uh, has at the base of it the idea that um, um, that uh, uh, experience, the actual experience uh, precedes the, the essence. So uh, in the statement, he says, I quote, none of us, K 
can escape our responsibility, however totalitarian or utopian our world may be, end quote. This is a very serious statement for somebody who has been uh, seen by uh, the wider public as a painter of cakes and confections. It is a very heavy statement, but uh, it is very important and it makes sense because if you continue reading this, the, the, the article, he explains that uh, any sort of painting is a chance for us, the viewers, to see ourselves in the work and to consider uh, what is it we're doing and why are we doing what we're doing? And uh, so there's this larger um, uh, aspect which goes beyond uh, painting and enjoying painting. And that idea really parallels to what uh, Henry Miller is saying when he talks about Auguste uh, in his uh, stage of before the scales fell off his eyes when he's just happy to uh, be a clown and he's, uh, he's loved by the crowd and he's kind of dissolving in this bliss of his artistry. And then he has um, this uh, uh, life-changing experience which shows him that you need to look outside. And this is exactly what uh, Tibu is saying here when he says, none of us can escape our responsibility. So, um, so the, the, the cakes are the cakes, but it is, there's a larger uh, exercise and a larger enterprise that we should be concentrating on, uh, which goes beyond simply uh, being engaged in painting. And uh, another point that he makes in the essay, in that, in that response, is that he says that even the banal objects, uh, like uh, cakes, for example, and confections, uh, they are um, a window into, they're kind of like a mirror, which we can hold up again to see, uh, I quote here, uh, they allow us to see ourselves looking at ourselves and to applaud or criticize what is especially us. Again, this is a very existentialist um, uh, idea that um, is easy uh, to lose in uh, if you just look at the cake paintings and you relate to them viscerally, you just think about, you know, they're good enough to eat because uh, the impasto uh, pain resembles uh, say the frosting or uh, the, the powdered sugar or whatnot. Um, so um, when we look at the clown paintings, the same idea applies. And this is uh, what, so 1962. So this is uh, uh, 50, I'm not counting right, 70, 70 years on, uh, he uh, paints a new series in which, again, the paintings are in the way they're, they're paintings, but they're also, they provide a possibility for us to examine our lives and to see what is happening in our lives. So um, if you look at this slide, the clown and beast, this is a good point uh, actually uh, to, to uh, turn to the more formal concerns that uh, Thibaut takes up in the 1962 article and uh, they can also kind of serve as a guide for looking at the exhibition at the Laguna Art Museum. In this painting, this is a large canvas, um, Clown and Beast. Uh, you could see uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, common representations of light in the clown series. And that is the, this light is the spotlight. The spotlight, uh, which uh, allows, so it's higher value at the center, and then it um, uh, fades away towards the edges. Sometimes there is an outline. This is a, a, a directed light, and it is um, the second most common type of lighting in these paintings. The, the other one is this uh, uh, all over fluorescent, uh, really bright light that we're used to in confection paintings. But uh, this one is more or less uh, uh, more or less the uh, trademark of the series. And here's again where we can look back and we can think about um, the Herman uh, cartoons with the spotlights on the crazy cat uh, figure. Uh, it's something that removes us uh, from the kind of daily life of 
all over fluorescent lighting um, and into the space of the stage, the circus or the cartoon. So it, in a way it kind of signals that now we're in the imaginary space. Um, and uh, here's an example of this. Um, uh, on one hand, you have this all over fluorescent light. On the other hand, you have, again, you have a spotlight, but in this spotlight in Clown and Circle from 2015, uh, you have the spotlight is cast in reverse, which actually makes the spotlight to act as an indicator of um, some sort of little abyss behind the clown. And that uh, shifts the whole thing into the uh, philosophical uh, dimension of the clown's sad fate, because he just might fall into uh, this, this uh, manhole behind him. And so that also, in a way, it kind of activates this idea that I mentioned previously, um, the, the ambiguous character of the circus. So it could be really funny at some point, and then it is not funny all of a sudden when tragedy strikes. And uh, within the space of the circus, this is something that, just like in Harriman's cartoons, so the clown may fall into this hole, and then he's OK in the end. Um, the other um, uh, innovation uh, that uh, that is uh, uh, common uh, in many of the shared by many of the works in the clown series uh, could be seen in this image of clown angel and dog from 2017. This is another uh, fairly large painting uh, which shows a figure of a clown with his uh, arms open and the dog sitting in front of him. So there's an immediate associational reference to St. Peter at the pearly gates and the um, um, pearly part is really important here because the whole painting is uh, kind of anchored on the idea of the glistening light, the, the, the glimmer, the glint and the pearly quality of the paint, which makes it very otherworldly. At the same time, when you look at this painting, you can also see that it has, it functions because of those little uh, lesion-like, um, almost kind of scrapes uh, that are done probably by the other uh, end of the brush, uh, you have this really physical manifestation of what Thibault calls simultaneity in lighting. So you have the kind of streaks of light that manifest themselves in uh, on the surface of the painting. And at the same time, you have uh, within the painting, you have this fictional space of the figure of the clown who is in the painting and uh, again, you have this ambiguity, you have this clash of um, the real and the imagined. And this is uh, so um, typical of the work in the series, that this uh, switch between the optical and the physical aspects and the metaphysical uh, concepts in the painting. And uh, so as long as we're in this image, I would like to now point out something about the space in this painting. Um, the space in the clown series oftentimes is activated by the figures in the uh, painting. So in other words, uh, the figures serve as a reference point that uh, um, uh, show uh, kind of the physical context of the space around them. But at the same time, uh, just like with the cakes, you keep shifting between uh, seeing the representation as uh, a physical fact and feeling it viscerally. In this case, uh, this is not something you can eat. Uh, this is an otherworldly image, sort of a, uh, an apparition. And uh, so the, the fact of um, this activated space just gives you this, uh, the um, almost um, uh, an endless, the expansive, um, space of a sky or something like this. So, uh, and uh, in many of the paintings, that is the case. Uh, if you look at this next painting, Clown with Ballerina, here's another way to treat space. Um, the painting, the figures here, the little figurine, uh, which supports uh, a dancer posing on it, is, is, um, uh, is um, placed against the background, literally, of a circus curtain with little scallop balances on the top. And then there's the circle, the different 
circles, which are probably circles of fabric on the floor. And uh, so this is a very contextual representation of space where you just have kind of normal reference point. And uh, it really adds a touch of visibility. So in some paintings, you really, uh, you, you can look at, at what is uh, being depicted and you could see an actual circus act. While in other paintings, something else is happening. For example, in uh, this uh, uh, canvas clown and makeup, you have um, uh, this dual interpretation of space. So on one hand, you have uh, a clown sitting in front of some sort of counter. And on this counter, there is a, a plate uh, with makeup and uh, a brush, uh, which you would use to apply this makeup. And the way the space is arranged because, uh, because of the uh, direction of the breaststrokes and the pattern on the bottom, uh, the counter acts simultaneously as an actual physical piece of furniture and as a device to flatten the composition and to press the clown against the wall. And that flat flatness is accentuated by the uh, diagonally tilted shadow on the, uh, in the background. So uh, you have this uh, uh, clash in the painting between the tilted clown and the, the counter behind which he sits. And one of them constantly cancels out the other uh, at the level of uh, being real. So you can, you can only believe into the counter or into, uh, in, in the counter or in the clown. In this painting, Clown and Shadow, you have uh, another interesting visual play. So first of all, when I saw this painting for the first time, I immediately thought um, of a clown uh, in a way, uh, not as a real clown, but as a figurine on the cake. And the reason I thought that is because uh, the edge of the arena that is designated by this kind of uh, uh, very faint uh, smile-like line in the foreground, the yellow and orange, uh, it also has uh, underneath their markings that make it look like the frosting on the side of the cake. So there's this, again, you, you have this uh, sort of ambiguity that shows you on one hand, it shows you a figure, on the other hand, it shows you uh, uh, a little little pantom, and the, his his face is you cannot uh, read it. It's illegible. It's just it's um, the only thing that is really prominent is this red nose, uh, the smudge of red. And uh, when you look at this painting, uh, because of the purple shadow on the side, it looks like the clown is to the left of the central axis, but actually. Uh, his nose is smack in the middle of, if you drew a cross on the painting, it would be straight in the middle. So you have this, again, this uh, ambiguous, the real position of the figure versus the perception of the figure. Uh, and uh, the, here, this challenge of representing a human figure, but at the same time, um, doing uh, some sort of uh, nod to the uh, more philosophical understanding of the role of the clown and the clown as an artist, and then um, uh, and then uh, of course making things which are intangible, like a shadow, as tangible as the actual figure through painting it. And this is something that is absolutely key to Thibaut's painting uh, and uh, to the painting of artists uh, of uh, other painters whom he loves and respects. Uh, in his opinion, the biggest achievement of um, a painter is to create its own world in painting, uh, a world that doesn't exist in real life. So painting, it's kind of similar to the notion that um, Kazimir Malevich had uh, about uh, the nature of painting, that painting needs to be an original creation. Um, and um, uh, so in Thibaut's paintings, what we see and whether we realize it or not, um, we are before a new, uh, completely new uh, world uh, and what he calls a new visual species, uh, something that is a thing unto itself. So it's not a representation of nature, but it's a creation, a new creation. In this next um, uh, painting, clown with red hair, uh, we 
uh, see uh, all the concerns that I described uh, so far, but here I would say uh, we also see the sense of um, uh, the sense of uh, con con contemporaneous uh, recollections. So, uh, as we know, the, the series harks back to his recollections of the circus from the 1930s, which is at the height of the Great Depression. And uh, in my opinion, this painting illustrates really well the uh, um, uh, characteristics in terms of light, in terms of color, of the uh, the sort of the, the sensory palette of the Great Depression. So the clown is dressed, he's kind of a tramp clown, uh, and uh, he's dressed in um, uh, patch top pants um, that are, uh, the patches don't quite match the the, the color of the pants and then the shirt, the rose shirt doesn't match the pants. And uh, he has this uh, uh, squished hat and um, um, the curtain, the kind of the curtain, the, uh, it, it's a normal velvet curtain, but it seems rather grimy. And uh, that impression is um, uh, furthered by the, the kind of the brownish gray, uh, part of the surface at the bottom of the painting. Uh, so that the whole thing uh, almost gives you an impression of that this is a scene done in incandescent lighting, this uh, you know single light bulb uh, in a dark room in the cold space uh, where a hungry person is uh, trapped. Uh, so that sort of sensation, I think, is um, something that uh, makes Again, uh, going back to the idea of a new visual species, uh, here you have um, this amalgam of meanings, of all the philosophical meanings, and then the almost kind of like a timestamp from the Great Depression. And um, uh, the humanity of this clown, and at the same time, he's also um, just um, a stand-in for a human being uh, with all the uh, misery that one uh, should experience inevitably uh, throughout one's life. Which uh, brings me to uh, the latest painting in the series, uh, the painting that Thibaut called 100 year old clown, uh, a very meaningful title in um, the view of the fact that uh, Thibaut just turned 100 in November. Um, this work was uh, uh, the last work, chronologically the last work in the series and uh, Thibaut actually describes it as a summation of the clown series. Um, I saw this work for the first time when it was still on the easel in uh, October of 2020. He finished it soon after and when I saw that work I, uh, I was absolutely blown away because what I saw in it was uh, not just a summation of the clown series but also a response, uh, a commentary on all of his work uh, over uh, more than seven decades. Um, it seemed to me like the painting actually, it's kind of like an index of many of the things that we know and love about his painting. For example, uh, the background is done in this uh, uh, bluish white uh, color that we recognize in uh, many of his paintings uh, and which became kind of a, uh, a signature signature background for Thibaut. Uh, the skull cap of the figure resembles a mountain and Thibaut has been painting mountains since 1965. When you look at the jacket of the old clown, uh, the jacket resembles the asphalt cover which um, the, the um, asphalt uh, road uh, which uh, he painted in his San Francisco streetscapes uh, in the 70s and in the 80s, uh, down to the point of the the, the line, um, the open, the kind of the line, this zip line that runs from the chin down, uh, imitating the um, the uh, dividing marks on the black top. When you uh, look. Uh, closely at the ear of the clown. The ear, to me, uh, recalls the uh, Sacramento 
delta landscapes from the 90s um, and the early 2000s, the, the same sort of uh, swirl uh, which abstracts the uh, actual uh, aerial landscape of uh, those uh, delta locations. Uh, and then of course, there's the still life element, which is visible in the face with, uh, first of all, this patina of makeup, the white makeup, uh, which kind of, of course resembles frosting. And then you have this, uh, uh, you know, cherry on the Sunday, the, the smudge, the little smudge, a little red smudge in the nose. And uh, uh, that again, it kind of punctuates uh, the painting. It's, it's um, uh, very imperfect. It's awkward and it almost, I would say kind of sloppily applied, but there's a reason for this. Thibaut's uh, uh, self-portrait quality in The 100-Year-Old Clown uh, resonates with the work of Pierre Bonnard, who is uh, uh, one of the models um, whose, whose self-portraits, whose late self-portraits are uh, one of the models for The 100-Year-Old Clown. Uh, Bonnard has uh, done a series of uh, incredible self-portraits in his later years which are, um, it's universally agreed that uh, these are incredible um, analysis of uh, old age and the, the frailty that comes with that, the wisdom that comes with that, the vulnerability that comes with that and uh, the pathos. And uh, what's interesting is that in the hundred year old clown, so that little sloppy um, um, uh, red paint on the nose comes from the same space as Bonnard's recognition of um, vulnerability. There is this uh, pull towards imperfection, a purposeful imperfection, which really um, relates to a very important quality in uh, Thibaut's painting and his attitude, his lack of presumption, his uh, lack of um, uh, purposeful pathos. So the pathos that we uh, can partake in is a result of this sorrow self-analysis. And uh, I would like to finish here with an image which uh, reiterates that very point. I uh, took uh, a picture of this painting that you're looking at in uh, 2019. It was in the studio amongst the clown paintings. Uh, this is a work that has been painted earlier, but uh, when I saw it in the studio, as you can see in the slide, it has this additional element of a little pasted fool's cap on the head of uh, this older man who is showing a painting to a woman. A woman kind of looks like a curator. And uh, when I asked him about this painting, he said that uh, it kind of makes him feel like a clown when he's showing, when an artist is showing his artwork in the studio to the visitors. And um, so my inevitable uh, follow-up question was, uh, does he himself associate with uh, clowns? And his response was uh, very telling. He said, if I had another profession, um, and then he said, uh, you want to be liked. And uh, the truth is, is that, of course, um, this is probably watching this uh, talk, uh, Thibaut is universally liked. Uh, and um, I would say that part of the reason for his wide um, acceptance by uh, the public that is much more interested often in the subject matter than in the uh, specifics of painting and its formal side, but nevertheless, uh, people go to his exhibitions and they leave with a smile. And this is a very important uh, characteristic of a viewer of Thibaut's paintings. His paintings make them smile. Um, so I would say that um, uh, what, part of his uh, uh, genius is to discover uh, that um, a quality, uh, that really badly needed quality uh, in art that American viewers need, the uplifting quality, the uh, uh, making the art that is redemptive and making the art that relies on humor and not on some sort of uh, thematic complexity or gratuitous gloom or drama. Um, 
he offers people images that come from the vocabulary that is familiar to them, be it confections or in this case, the clowns. And uh, they feel free to explore painting. In other words, uh, he always leaves in his work, he always kind of leaves the door open so that the viewers can come in. And what they do from there is uh, an entirely different matter, but people are welcome to look at the art that he makes by the subject matter. At the same time, and despite the fact that uh, there has been kind of an overemphasis on the uh, what he paints versus how he paints, uh, he always has been deadly serious about uh, a painting and, 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 and taking his craft very, very seriously. And um, uh, here, I would like to bring back, uh, again, uh, refer to the words of Auguste, the protagonist of Miller's uh, novella, The a Smile at the Foot of the Letter, uh, when Auguste says that uh, in art, in his craft, he says, quote, nothing is unimportant, nothing. Instead of laughter and applause, you will receive smiles, contented little smiles. That's all, but it's everything. This is more than one could ask for, end quote. And uh, these are the smiles that uh, Thibault receives from the viewers of his paintings. So the factor of adulation, the factor of the love of the crowd is really unimportant. But what matters is that the paintings make people smile and uh, I hope that when the museum reopens, you'll have a chance to visit this exhibition in person and smile at these wonderful paintings from the Clown series. Thank you.